From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. Have you noticed something missing right in the heart of downtown Portland? If you drive over the Broadway Bridge into downtown, you can't help but notice things look a lot different. The old U.S. Post Office is gone. And from 9th Avenue looking east, you can see Union Station on 6th Avenue for the first time. It's no longer blocked by the Post Office. So what's going on? What is the plan for that 34-acre site located within the central city in northwest Portland? Most of the properties are owned by Portland Housing Bureau and by Prosper Portland the Economic and Urban Development Agency for the city. In this episode of Straight Talk, we find out more about the project called the Broadway Corridor, designed to connect the Old Town, Chinatown, and Pearl District neighborhoods. The project aims to include high-density employment, mixed-income housing, a park, signature city attractions and amenities. It's been billed as the next great place in Portland. We have key people on the project joining us. Kimberly Branham is the executive director of Prosper Portland. She's responsible for ensuring Portland achieves the mission of creating economic growth and opportunity throughout the city. Molly Rogers is the interim director of Portland's Housing Bureau. She has 25 years of experience in affordable housing, community development, and ending homelessness. In her current position, she leads planning and implementation of a $300 million budget focused on affordable housing and housing stabilization. And Tawana Hennessy joins us. She's been the leader of outreach for the Carpenters Union for nearly three years. Before that, she was a leader in HR and business development at UPS, and she wears many other leadership hats in the community efforts driving the Broadway Corridor Project. Welcome everyone to Straight Talk. It's really nice to have you here to talk about this exciting project. So good to be Thank here. You. Thank you. Well, let's start off and kind of set the scene here. How significant is this project? How big of a deal is it for the future of the city and the people of Portland? We'll start with Kimberly. Well, it's a tremendous opportunity. As you mentioned, we're talking about 30 acres plus in the heart of our central city, right between the Pearl District, one of our newest neighborhoods, and Old Town, our oldest neighborhood in the central city. And it gives us an opportunity to build thousands of units of housing, to create opportunities for uh, thousands of new employment opportunities, and to really be a welcoming and inclusive place in the heart of our city. Tawana, how big of a deal do you think it is? Oh, just to piggyback on what Kimberly said, this is a tremendous opportunity. And when I think of the opportunity, I think of the opportunity for local contractors to work on a major project. I look at the opportunity for um, the houseless to have, you know, safe and stable housing. And, and I, I think the biggest thing is just to, uh, for everyday people, the boots on the grounds to have an opportunity for good jobs and good wages and benefits. And we're going to dig into all of that in just a moment. Molly, what do you think? Well, first of all, being able to envision and recreate a community in the central city is really a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, so be able to center on affordable housing to ensure we're creating an inclusive, balanced and diverse community is going to be essential to its success and vibrancy. Mm -hmm. um, so this is crucial for addressing our housing shortage that we face right now. And it's crucial that we address our disparities in racial equity uh, that many renters and homeowners face in Portland right now. We'll find out more about housing from you because we do have a huge mm -hmm. shortage of housing that the governor has talked a lot about. Well, Kimberly, there's a lot of history surrounding this project. So tell us a little bit about the history, put it in context. So the site itself is significant. It's long been a center of commerce going back to Native American communities who uh, traded there, uh, thinking about the history of the Japanese American and Chinese American and African American communities who called it their home. Um, and then most recently it's been the post office site. Um, and since about 1988, uh, maybe a little bit before, there was an idea to um, move the post office out um, of the central city. And so included in the central city plan in 1988, as soon as that, people were thinking about what could you do there. Um, in the Central City 2035 plan, it was articulated as one of the biggest opportunities in the Central City. And so when Prosper Portland and the Portland Housing Bureau were able to acquire it from the post office in 2016, we immediately started working to talk about how we can make good on 
the promise um, that had long been envisioned. What was the initial vision and how has it changed over the years? Sure. Well, you know, we started with um, thinking a lot about the lessons learned from other major development projects. Um, and so one of the things that we wanted to do early on was to have a steering committee that could guide that process. Um, and so working with them on um, you know, what should the values be that underpin this? We thought about inclusion, we thought about connectivity, we thought about climate action, we thought about racial equity, we thought about, um, you know, how do, we, how do we really bridge these two communities together? Um, and so the framework has evolved over time, but it's really stayed, um, sort of, it has, it has stayed true to the original idea of having a dense, mixed-use um, urban district that is welcoming. Um, and um, I think there was always a sense that we would probably have a termination of the North Park blocks and an extension of the North Park blocks, and that's continued. Um, and one of the elements that's really exciting is that there will be a, a beautiful portion of the Green Loop, which is this idea of a linear park that would circle a good portion of the central city. Um, and so those elements have evolved um, throughout the life of the envisioning of the plan. We'll find out more specifically about some of those elements. Tuana, there are a lot of community partners who, who've been a part of this great vision. Can you give us an example of some of those partners? Who's been at the table in this planning? Uh, thank you. Um, so as it relates to Broadway Quarter, the Healthy Community Coalition has been um, up front and center. Uh, it's an organization, excuse me, the committee has about 20 different organizations that actually sat down with Prosper, with the city of Portland to negotiate a community benefits agreement um, for this specific project. And what a community benefit uh, agreement does, it opens up opportunities for the underrepresented population, for women, for people of color, um, and just for the working class people that don't ordinarily have an opportunity to do this type of work. So um, the Healthy Community Coalition works hand in hand with Kimberly. We meet uh, on a regular basis just so that we can monitor the progress of of the project mm -hmm. so so much goes into this and I understand Molly you and Kimberly were at a city council meeting on Wednesday talking about something called an intergovernmental agreement what's that all about <laughs> well um, we uh, prosper Portland is a uh, is a quasi governmental entity that is separate from the city of Portland uh, I work for the, the Portland Housing Bureau and we have to enter into an agreement and really what it is it's laying the groundwork of how we're going to implement a shared goal of creating 720 affordable housing uh, units within the Broadway corridor. And when we say affordable housing, we mean housing that's affordable to households earning 60% of area median income and below. And that could be a lot of different strategies. Uh, PHB has identified a parcel within the, um, the USPS site that we will then uh, build and invest and bring in a development partner to be able to go vertical and make sure that all that housing is, uh, is affordable to those households at zero to 60% AMI. Um, additionally, um, we, we have what we call um, development rights uh, within the, the rest of the uh, market rate building. So as a developer comes in, wants to put in uh, market rate housing, we have purchased some what we call floor area ratio. Um, that helps um, offset some of the um, uh, some of the components and costs that, that it would, they would incur in building that. And what we're buying instead is for them to have some of those units be affordable as well. So we're creating inclusivity across the whole district, as well as some anchor investments at that parcel that we know for sure will be there forever for affordable housing. What kind of response did you get from City Council on Wednesday? Did they react at all? I felt it was uh, a resounding support. Um, it was a first reading, so it will have to go back to council for an actual vote. Um, but the questions from council, was uh, they were very engaged. They wanted to really understand what kind of community we're building. They wanted to understand some of the financing mechanisms um, and what risks there were to the city. Um, but I think overall, the view is we have to continue down this path that we've that prosper and PHB have envisioned since 2016 because that's what ne the city needs right now in economic recovery let's talk about something really fun because I think people are really interested in demolition like what <laughs> happened to the to the post office Tawana tell us how big of an undertaking that was oh that was a major um, undertaking uh, there were about 150 um, workers that were there uh, there were laborers there were carpenters there were heavy equipment operators there 
and tireless hours went into making sure that this was done in a safe way. And um, it's, it was, it's amazing. Well, let's take a look at it. We have, we have some video, some time-lapse video sure. of the demolition. We'll take a look at it, then we'll talk about it. You can, you can see the seasons change. How, Tawana, tell us, how long did this take, this demolition? Oh my gosh, only if it took that amount of time. <laughs> but it, it took a, a lot of time. And what you're seeing is actually about a year's worth uh, of work, of planning, of um, just contractors coming together, subcontractors coming together, workers coming together and um, doing hazmat remediation and all sorts of things. And so this is actually a year's worth of work that's been ongoing. So it's a human beings. I mean, this work doesn't happen without a lot of talented, dedicated human beings. Tell us a little bit more about the workers you involved. You are absolutely right. So there were multiple companies, uh, multiple contractors, um, just a whole host of people and workers that came together to make this um, make this happen. And, you know, we highlighted some of this to make sure that there were BIPOC um, contractors there. So there was really great work. We were intentional about who we brought on board to make sure that we got this done. I know there was a really great effort to make sure that you did hire minority owned yes. contractors. And we have a graphic that yes. highlights some of the stats. So I'll read some of the stats and then we'll talk about it. The current phase of demolition and remediation work is a 30 plus million dollar investment. Mm -hmm. More than 90% of the work on the site is being performed by certified minority owned firms. The project has met or exceeded its workforce goals for women in almost all categories. Mm -hmm. And there will be 4,000 plus jobs at the site at full build out. Tawana, can you tell us a little bit more about some of those stats? Isn't that exciting? Amazing. First of all, um, that, that we were able to do that. And that comes from being intentional. And just, just to give you a little bit more information, 98% of those are COVID um, uh, contractors. So that number is almost at 100%. And that is so exciting. Mm -hmm. The workforce, uh, women, people of color, uh, for women, uh, we've exceeded those goals. Where there's a 6% goal, we're at 86 and it just keeps climbing and climbing. And again, that comes from being intentional, that comes from having relationships, that comes from meeting with one another and deciding you know, how we move forward. If we're falling short, how are we gonna reach these goals so that we can not only uh, complete the project, but so that the community can be happy. You know, I'm curious, uh, you represent the Carpenters Union. How many carpenters are women? Do we have a lot of women that are carpenters? You know, we do have, um, well, I'll say this, we're now 12 states. Um, as a whole, we have 90,000 uh, uh, members. And of that, I'll say about um, a third or fourth of that is, is women. However, we are actively engaging with women as these projects come up and, and they're able to see that women are actually doing the work, right? We're able to pull more women in. Oh, that's great. Molly, I want to talk more about housing. Let's let's dig into more because that's what people are going to see first, right? The first vertical thing is going to be housing. So tell us a little bit more about what we can expect to see right off the bat when we start seeing building and construction. Yes, for sure. After uh, the demolition, we're going to have to start the work of rebuilding a new community. So that's laying out uh, pavement and sidewalks and roads. And, um, and, and address the other infrastructure needs before we can what we call go vertical. Um, so what we need to do is we need to build, bring in a development partner um, and start envisioning, envisioning what that coming community will look like. Um, when we say vertical, we're talking about a high rise of probably 12 to 15 stories um, that we're gonna put on that par parcel four and uh, start making it, it's gonna be a multifamily uh, apartment complex that we're hoping will be a range of bedroom sizes and we need to think about a range of income levels as well. Is that the one that's gonna look like the Louisa Flowers building next to the convention center? So we have a picture of that. Yes, we have, um, exactly. So that's a similar project where it is a half block um, that we were able to go up to, I believe 13 stories. And um, it's over 200 units, and that's what we're envisioning for that first phase of Broadway Corridor, is about over 200 units of affordable housing. Now, where are we on, on developers right now? Is, is this a done deal? I mean, are you sure you're gonna get all the developers you need? Uh, do you wanna jump in on that, or, or Kimberly? Well, I can speak to the development of the post office that's not the uh, 
for uh, Block 4. So we right now um, have an exclusive negotiation agreement with uh, Related and Melvin Mark. Um, and so we are in a process of discussing with them what it would look like to enter into a development and disposition agreement. So to sell the property to them um, over a certain number of phases. Um, and so we anticipate that we will hear back from them early in 2024 in terms of what they might be interested in um, entering into in terms of a partnership. Um, and so we're excited about the possibility of working with them and refining that. So how are you trying to keep the city's climate goals in mind as you progress through this project? Do you want to take that one on? Happy to start with that. So um, there are a couple of elements. This was really important when we were going through the master planning process and when we were engaging with community and when we were engaging with our Healthy Communities uh, Coalition partners. Um, and so there are a couple of elements. So one is that there are high standards, lead, gold, and above for the development, future development at the site. We also thought a lot about how people get to the site um, and from the site. And so um, single occupancy vehicle um, numbers will be very low um, and will really leverage all of the amazing transportation um, and multimodal access that uh, exists there. You'll also see that there's uh, more than 20% of the site is open space. So we'll have a robust tree canopy. Um, and then we are working with partners on how we can ultimately achieve a net carbon zero development um, with PGE and others. Is there something else to add from the housing component on the climate goals? Yes, well, uh, well we, we have been able to forge a partnership with uh, our sister bureau, uh, Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, the Portland Clean Energy Fund. So we want to be able to invest, uh, co-invest in our multifamily mm -hmm. in ways that reduces our carbon footprints, um, look at energy efficient multifamily, solar panels if possible, mm -hmm. um, air quality, um, uh, as much as we can efficient air conditioning because we know we are we're getting hotter um, so we want to have a, a quality of life um, that is very strong for our, our residents living in the housing. Well it's time for us to take a break but a lot more I want to find out about coming up we'll look at the grand vision for the Broadway corridor look at renderings what planners envision and get a time life for completion stick around we're back in two minutes. Welcome back to Straight Talk, I'm Laurel Porter. We're talking about what's being called the next great place in Portland. It will go in where the old U.S. Post Office used to be. What's the Broadway Corridor all about? We find out from key people involved with the project. Prosper Portland's Executive Director Kimberly Branham is here. Also joining us Molly Rogers, the Interim Director of the Portland Housing Bureau, and Tawana Hennessy, the Outreach Representative for the Northwest Regional Council of Carpenters. Once again, thanks for being here. This has been really fun to find out about this project because all of us have noticed the post office being gone, but we wonder what, what's going in there. So what is the, the grand vision when it's all said and done? What do you think this is going to look like? What your hopes are for it, Kimberly? Well, ZGF Architects and the um, place team was uh, the team that put together our master plan. And so when you see the renderings, I just want to recognize the local teams that did that amazing work. Um, and what they imagined and what we uh, pulled together collectively is this dense, mixed use, inclusive, very welcoming site. Um, and so what you'll see along Johnson Avenue, Northwest Johnson Avenue is it will be, it'll, uh, I think you're seeing that right now, um, it will feel like a main street. Um, and then we'll have the park that will complete the North Park blocks and along that we'll have both an affordable housing development as other residential, as well as other residential development. And to the North end, there's really an opportunity to have major employment centers. Now, of course, um, you know, this is all going to be built out over 10 to 20 years, and so um, there will be a lot more that will come to life, but I think it will feel like a very vibrant, inclusive, and really connected place. Tawana, what are your hopes for this project? Uh, just to tag along with what Kimberly said, she said it so eloquently, um, I'd really like to see laughter. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see children playing. I'd like to see diverse groups coming together and living together. I'd like to see the workers that helped to build the project actually be able to live there and enjoy the downtown area. And what about trying to make this project racially just? Um, what are the efforts there? Uh, community benefits agreements um, are a way that a tool that we use to do that again going back to making sure that there are women and people of color that the minority contracting community is also represented in actually building the buildings um, so there that is a way to do that um, 
I wish we didn't have to do it that way. I wish that, you know, Oregon would just be a place where we could all just go to work and not have to carve out those tools, but we have to do that right now. So those are the things that we have in place that are able to tackle that issue. And Molly, what are your dreams for the Broadway corridor? Well, very much a place that's welcoming, a place where people feel they have a sense of belonging. There's not, um, uh, doesn't feel like an enclave of only for affluent people, mm -hmm. that we are uh, bringing in a place for those who are really are really essential workers in, in the city can live and thrive and play there as well. Um, we're talking about people who are bus drivers, people who are our grocery store workers, people who are teachers. Um, they, ne they deserve and they need more homes as well. Um, so be able to center and anchor an early investment means we can uh, be able to uh, have those folks be centered in how the rest of the community gets built out. Um, and how we really look at that, and, and similar to what Twana said, we want to really look at um, who are the communities that were initially um, perhaps displaced many, many decades, um, generations ago? Mm -hmm. How do we ensure some r r ability to come back and thrive in that community? Mm -hmm. We're looking, we're gonna ask our development partners to do additional marketing and outreach mm -hmm. um, to disrepresent, underrepresented um, populations that have disproportionately have not had access to housing. So that's how we wanna build out mm -hmm. to create that more inclusive community. And Kimberly, you mentioned 10 or 20 years. What's the timeline for this? Well, so um, in the immediate term, we're going to see the site um, be fully um, open and it'll uh, you know, be environmentally cleaned up. Um, and then Northwest Johnson and Kearney will be built out by Portland um, Bureau of Transportation. Um, and then after that, you'll start to see the first phase of development happening in um, 25, 26. And then it could be another 10, 20 years until it's fully built out, depending on what we see from the market and developer interest. What is this park going to look like? I mean, yeah. Portlanders love their parks. Is it going to be a green space? Will it be more like Pioneer Courthouse Square or Director's yeah. Park? Yeah. So um, their parks actually just um, hired um, the team to really imagine it more fully. But um, as it's envisioned right now, it will be an open green space. Um, people really wanted a space where they could use a soccer ball and have a picnic and come together. Um, and it will, um, so right in the heart of the of the development. Um, and then at the end of it, there will be the green loop that will connect up to the bridge. Um, and, and we so have a see, picture of that here, yeah, of the so green loop. Yeah, you'll see about a 35 foot increase. And so eventually the green loop will take you from the park up to uh, the, the bridge. Um, so you'll have a beautiful view of the development and of the river from the top of, of the development. And given the changing dynamic of, of working from home mm -hmm. since the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Will there be less emphasis on office space? There's so many vacant offices downtown and more than on residences. We certainly imagine that the first phases will be residential development. Um, and one of the things that's terrific about the master plan is that um, it really allows us as the market evolves to determine what is, is needed. So I would imagine that there would be less uh, traditional office space um, and probably more mixed use buildings um, and potentially places where people can live and work. Um, and so I, th I think it'll be interesting to see how it evolves over the next Well, it's decade. such an exciting project. I want to give you each about 20 seconds or so for a final thought about the Broadway corridor. Start with Molly. Well, um, we're, very, we're very much excited to think about housing opportunities that can help address our housing shortage we have right now. We believe we need uh, 120,000 more units um, of housing in the next 20 years. So this will be able to be a, a catalyst um, of, um, of incredible amount of thousands of, of new units that could go into the central city to help address that shortage. And we have to uh, recognize that we right now the average black Portlander cannot afford to live, um, rent or buy in any neighborhood of the city. And we have to address uh, through with these housing investments ways that we're addressing racial equity and bringing in additional um, outreach work to make sure folks um, who, a diverse set of households, um, especially our BIPOC households, can have a place to call home right in the central city. I only can give you about 10 seconds. We're almost out of time. Twana, do you have a quick uh, thought? Sure. Um, let's not forsake the people for the buildings. Let's make sure that everyone can afford to live and work and play in the area. And let's also honor the memory of those that came before us mm -hmm. whose um, homes, hopes, and dreams 
um, were dashed and let us now inherit it. Well, Twana, Molly, Kimberly, thank you for joining us here on Straight Talk. We really appreciate it. Thank you for watching and listening. Remember, you can get Straight Talk as a podcast. Search for KGW Straight Talk wherever you get your podcasts. Join us next week when we talk to Basic Rights Oregon about the state of LGBTQ plus rights in the nation and here at home. We'll see you next week.